Okay, so this evening we're going to look at something called linear momentum and impulse and how we use these uh, in physics. So we have to introduce what linear momentum is and also what impulse is. Okay, so uh, what is linear momentum? So basically we will show you that linear momentum is defined as a product of mass and the velocity of that particular object. So if an object has got a certain amount of mass and it's moving with a certain amount of velocity, when you multiply the mass times the velocity, you get what is called linear momentum. Now we, with this mass being multiplied by velocity, we use linear momentum as a measure of the mo motion of an object. Because if the velocity is zero, which means that this particular object is not moving, when you multiply this velocity times the mass, you're still going to get zero. So we use linear momentum as a measure of the motion of an object. Uh, the other thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the relationship between force and linear momentum. How is the force related to the linear momentum? Then after that, when you, once you find this relationship between force and linear momentum, we are going to look at something called impulse. So what is impulse? So we will show that impulse is actually just a change in linear momentum. Then, last but not least, uh, we're going to look at the relationship between linear momentum and kinetic energy. So, for starters, uh, how do we define linear momentum? What does it do? So the symbol for linear momentum is small p. And what does linear momentum do? Linear momentum simply measures an object's motion. So it gives you a measure of the motion which an object is undergoing. You are going to agree with me that our description of what motion has been, us looking at velocity, uh, acceleration, and all these things, without looking at the mass of the object, is not a complete description. Okay, so in this case, when it comes to linear momentum, we also include the mass of the object. The mass of the object is a measure of that object's inertia. Inertia is basically a tendency of an object to stay at rest or to continue moving at constant velocity. So that's what inertia is. So we are looking at the mass of the object. We are also looking at the velocity of the object. So this mass of the object, we multiply it by the velocity. And what we get is what is called linear momentum. And this is how we get it. Uh, P is equals to M multiplied by V. M is the mass of the object and V is the velocity of that particular object. So as you can see, uh, the ma if an object has got mass, that mass is the same. The only thing which can change in this case is the velocity of the object. If the velocity decide if the object decides to be at rest then the velocity of the object is going to be zero if the object and in that case if the velocity is going to be equal to zero zero multiplied by the mass of the object gives you a linear momentum which equals to zero so basically that's telling you this object is not moving okay on the other hand if the velocity of the object is not equals to zero then you have your velocity whatever the velocity is multiplied by the mass and you get yourself or the value of linear momentum. So the size of the linear momentum tells you about the motion which is happening. If there is no linear momentum, then the object is not moving. For you to get linear momentum, as you can see, I'm multiplying the mass. The mass is measured in kgs and uh, velocity, which is measured in meters per second squared. So linear momentum has got units of kgs meters per second. So those are the units of linear momentum. It evolves the mass and also the velocity of the object. The other thing you're supposed to be aware of, you are multiplying mass. Mass is a scalar quantity. So mass has got size, but has got no direction. You are multiplying mass times the velocity. Velocity is a vector quantity. A vector has got size and also direction. So when you multiply a scalar quantity, in this case, mass times a vector, velocity, what you get is a vector. So linear momentum is a vector. As you are multiplying the, bar, the scalar, which is the mass times the, the, a vector, which is the velocity, the product of a scalar and a vector is a vector. So linear momentum is a vector. What that means is that there is direction. Direction is important in this case when it comes to linear momentum. Are we clear on what we have said linear momentum is? It simply measures the motion of an object of mass m moving with velocity v 
So we give a number to how an object is moving by using the mass of the object and the velocity with which this particular object is moving. There is some physical quantity we assign to this whole thing. Any questions? On what linear momentum is? Okay, if there are no questions, next we move on to linear momentum and Newton's second law of motion. Now, we know that Newton's second law of motion gives us the connection between a force, which is in this case a resultant force. If a resultant force is present, it gives us a connection between the resultant force, which is F in this case, the mass of the object and the acceleration which this force is going to cause. This is Newton's second law of motion. It says if a resultant force is present and this resultant force is not equal to zero and it's acting on an object of mass m, then there's going to be an acceleration caused. The acceleration is going to be proportional to the result, it's going to be in the direction of the resultant force and it's going to be proportional to the resultant force and it's going to be inversely proportional to the mass and hence this is what we have f is equals to ma the f what you have here is the resultant force or the external force the m is the mass of the object and the a is acceleration of the object now what we want to do using newton's second law of motion what we want to do is to get a connection between the the force the mass and uh, sorry, the, the force and the linear momentum. So for us to do that, we know that our acceleration A is equals to the final velocity minus the initial velocity divided by the time, V minus U divided by T. This is our acceleration. So this acceleration, we substitute it in here. When we do that, we end up having F is equals to mass, then this which we have as acceleration, V minus U divided by T. So we multiply, the mass times v so we end up having mv we multiply the mass times u we end up having mu so we end up having mv minus mu on top divided by t so what we can see here is that we are multiplying mass times velocity so this mv here is actually linear momentum here also we are multiplying mass times velocity uh, initial velocity so this part also is also linear momentum so what you have when you're multiplying the mass times the final velocity this is what you call the final linear momentum when you multiply the mass times the initial velocity this is what you call the initial linear momentum so with this we can replace this mv with this quantity pf which is the final linear momentum minus the initial linear momentum divided by the time this final linear momentum minus initial linear momentum is the change in linear momentum on top here the change in linear momentum divided by the time so you can see that the resultant force f is given as the change in linear momentum divided by the time so basically this change in linear momentum divided by the time it's a measure of how fast the momentum the linear momentum of an object is changing so if the linear momentum of an object is changing then that shows you that there is a force which is acting on this particular object if there is a force acting on a particular object then that particular object is going to undergo a change in linear momentum if there is no force then there's going to be no change in linear momentum this is a force we are interested in a force causes the velocity or the motion of an object to change that's what force does so if the motion of an object does not change, then it means that there is no force acting on this particular object. The force we are interested in is a resultant force, this F. This F is a resultant force. Are we clear? Are we clear on what linear momentum is? Are we also clear on how resultant force is related to linear momentum? The resultant force F is a measure of how fast the linear momentum of a body is changing. Are we clear?
okay next uh comes up uh we look at something called impulse now impulse is defined as the product of the force which is the resultant force and the time over which this force is acting on an object so this force f which you have here in newton's second law of motion this force f is not always there sometimes the resultant force is there sometimes it's not there if the resultant force is not there then the velocity of the object remains the same so there will be no acceleration the resultant force is what causes acceleration so if the resultant force f is not there then that particular object will not undergo any acceleration other times the resultant force can be there if it is positive as you can see here if f is positive then this delta p which is the change in linear momentum is going to be positive what that means is that the velocity of this particular object is going to increase or the linear momentum of this particular object is going to increase or you can say the motion of this object will increase if the resultant force f is negative then it means that the motion of this particular object will reduce because the time itself which is how long this t you have here it is how long this particular force is present cannot be negative so if f can be is negative it is because the change in linear momentum is negative or if f is positive it's because the change in linear momentum is positive now Impulse is what you have when you multiply the resultant force F times the duration of time this resultant force is acting on a body. Like I was saying earlier, a resultant force is not going to be there the whole day. It's going to be there for a certain amount of time. During that amount of time a resultant force is there, it will cause the velocity of an object to increase or it will cause the velocity of an object to reduce depending on whether the resultant force is positive or it's negative. If the resultant force is positive, then the velocity of the object will increase. The object will move faster. If the resultant force is negative, then the velocity of the object will reduce. The object will slow down. Okay. Are we clear? So, impulse is when you multiply the force, the resultant force, times the time the resultant force is, is active or is present. And how do we get this? So, we, got, we come back to here. F is equal to the change in linear momentum divided by the time. So, if you multiply both sides by T, so you multiply both sides of this equation by T. So, if you multiply both sides, you haven't done anything, you end up having this. FT equals to delta P. This FT here, as you can see, this is how we have defined impulse. So it turns out that the product of the resultant force multiplied by uh, the product of the resultant force and the time for which the resultant force is acting on a body is also equals to the change in linear momentum. So this FT is also equals to the change in linear momentum. So this change in linear momentum, this is what we refer to as impulse. Delta P is equal to FT. So the impulse is equal to the resultant force multiplied by the time. This is a very, very important relationship. Because if there is going to be acceleration, it means that this particular object which is accelerating, uh, accelerating has got a certain amount of mass if the object has got a certain amount of mass, it means that there's going to be a change in linear momentum. However, this acceleration will not be there for the whole day. The acceleration will only happen for a certain amount of time. And during that amount of time, there is this force which is acting on the object which is causing the acceleration. So if you multiply the resultant force causing the acceleration, by the amount of time this acceleration is happening, what you get is impulse. So you can define impulse as MV, which is the final uh, linear momentum minus mu uh, initial linear momentum this is because of that the units of impulse ft 
F is measured, which is a force, is measured in newtons, then the T is measured in seconds. So you end up having units of this, newton second. Are we clear? Are we clear? Yes. Okay. So let's look at some examples. Uh, example number one. A 2 kg block, uh, sorry, a 2 kg brick is moving at a speed of 6 meters per second. How large a force F is needed to stop the brick in 7 times 10 to the power minus 4 seconds? So you have a, four, uh, you have a brick with a mass of 2 kg, and this brick has got an initial velocity of 6 meters per second. Then this brick is brought to a stop. When it comes to a stop, its final velocity is going to be uh v is going to be equal to zero meters per second and all this thing happens in this amount of time so the first thing you notice is that the, the velocity of the brick changes from six meters per second to zero so this brick is accelerating if the velocity of an object changes from six meters per second to zero meters per second it means that the brick is accelerating and acceleration of an object is caused by a force so there is a force which is causing this particular brick to come to a stop and that is a force we are looking for so the good part here is that we know the mass of the block it's 2 kg we know the initial velocity of the block 6 meters per second we know the final velocity of the block which is 0 meters per second and we know for how long this acceleration takes place so with this information, we can use our knowledge of impulse. Impulse is equal to the change in linear momentum. And what we're calling impulse is just basically this. We do it like that. So delta P, which is impulse, is equal to the final linear momentum, mv, minus the initial linear momentum, mu. The final velocity is 0 meters per second because our brake comes to a stop. The initial uh, velocity is 6 meters per second that's our initial velocity the mass of the block is 2 kg so we can work we can substitute in here so the mass is 2 kg that's what you have here the final velocity of the brick is 0 meters per second that's what you have here minus the mass of the brick is 2 kg that's what you have here the initial velocity of the brick is 6 meters uh, 6 meters per second that's what you have here when you work out this what you end up having is a change in linear momentum which is equal to minus 12 kg meters per second so your change in linear momentum is negative as you can see the reason why the change in linear momentum is negative is because this particular object when it comes this particular brick when it comes to a stop it loses motion so if an object loses motion then the change in linear momentum is going to be negative. If an object gains motion, then the change in linear momentum is going to be positive. So we have a change in linear momentum, which is negative 12 kg meters per second. Now we know that this change in linear momentum of negative 12 kg meters per second is also equals to whatever the resultant force is multiplied by the time this resultant force is present for. So the resultant force F multiplied by the time or the duration for which the resultant force is acting gives us the change in linear momentum. We have been told that this acceleration happens for this amount of time, 7 times 10 to the power minus 4 seconds. So we know how much time this whole thing happens. So we can substitute the time there when we do that. So we end up having Ft equals to minus 12 kg meters per second. Then for the time, when we substitute the time, we have what F equals to 7 times 10 to the power minus 4 seconds equals to minus 12 kg meters per second. This is what you have here. Um, next, we divide both sides by the time, 7 times 10 to the power minus 4 seconds. So F, we end up having F is equals to minus 12 kg meters per second divided by 7 times 10 to the power minus 4 seconds. So this is what we have. So this gives us a force F of minus 17,143 kgs meters per second. 
This force in newtons is just minus 17, minus 1.7, approximately minus 1.7 times 10 to the power 4 newtons, which translates to minus 17 kilonewtons. So, the first thing you notice is that our force is negative. A negative force means that this force is acting in a direction which is opposite the motion of the object. So as the object goes one way, the force is pointing the other direction. And of course, the size of the force is 17 kilonewtons. So this is not a small amount of force. This force, which is negative, which always acts in a direction opposite the motion of the object, this is what is called friction force. So whenever an object comes to a stop, the reason why an object comes to a stop is because there is friction. Friction is what causes an object comes to a stop. So when something is sliding, then it comes to a stop. When something is sliding, then it comes to a stop. The reason why that's happening is because of friction. So we can actually use this impulse relationship to find out how much friction is responsible for bringing an object to a stop. Okay. Another example where we can use impulse is example two. A 15 gram bullet moving at 300 meters per second passes through a two centimeter thick sheet of foam plastic and images with a speed of 90 meters per second. What average force impedes its motion through the plastic? So we have a bullet which has got a mass of 15 grams. Before it passes through this plastic, the bullet was moving with a velocity of 300 meters per second. After it passes through the plastic, it comes out on the other side and its velocity is now 90 meters per second. So you can see that the process of passing through the plastic has reduced the velocity of the bullet from 300 to 90 meters per second. So there was acceleration which was happening as the bullet was passing through the plastic. The bullet was slowed down. The slowing down of anything is caused by a force. So there's a force which was present as the bullet was passing through the plastic and this force slowed down the bullet from 300 to 90 meters per second. The thickness of the plastic we are told is 2 centimeters. So during this time it's 2 centimeters. So we want to find the force. We can find the force. And how do we find the force? We use the fact that the bullet has got mass and it has velocity, 300 meters per second. And it came out of the plastic with this. So we can see that since the velocity of the bullet reduced, it means that the momentum of the bullet changed. So we can work out what the change in momentum is. And how do we work out the change in momentum? We need to know the mass of the bullet. But in this case, uh, the mass of the bullet is in, is in grams. So you can't do calculations in grams. You need to change the mass of the bullet to be in kgs. So we end up having 0 0.015 kgs. So we can work out what the impulse is. Impulse is the change in linear momentum. So the change in linear momentum here, delta P is equals to the mass of the bullet multiplied by the final velocity of the bullet minus the mass of the bullet multiplied by the initial velocity of the bullet. The final velocity of the bullet when it comes out of the plastic is 90 meters per second. The initial velocity of the bullet when before it passes through the plastic is 300 meters per second. And of course, the mass of the bullet doesn't change as it's passing through the plastic. We assume that the mass, the bullet does not lose any mass as it passes through this plastic. So the mass is the same. So the change, uh, the impulse, delta P is going to be equal to the mass of the bullet, which is 0 0.015 kgs multiplied by the final velocity, which is 90 meters per second, minus uh, 0 0.015 kgs times, which is the mass of the bullet, times the 300 meters per second, which is the initial velocity of the bullet. And this is going to give us an impulse, delta P, which is equal to minus 3.15 kgs meters per second. So this is the impulse. This is a change in linear momentum. This change in linear momentum, as you can see, it's negative. This negative sign is telling you that this particular bullet, as it passed through the plastic, it lost motion. The bullet lost motion as it passes through the plastic. And you can see that from the fact that it comes out of, out of the plastic with a reduced velocity. So the bullet loses motion there. By exploiting our impulse relationship, we know that the impulse is also equals to 
the resultant force, which is the force causing this bullet to slow down as it is passing through the plastic multiplied by the time it takes the bullet to pass through the plastic. Because during this time the bullet is passing through the plastic, that is the only time this force is present. So you've got the resultant force, which is there as the bullet is passing through the plastic and during the time the bullet is passing through the plastic, the resultant force is present. So you have the resultant force multiplied by the time it takes the bullet to pass through the plastic. What this gives you is the change in linear momentum. And this is what we already have, we have already worked out here, that the change in linear momentum is minus 3.15 kgs meters per second. So this is what you have here. Ft is equal to minus 3.15 kgs meters per second. So this we know. However, at the moment, we do not know. We are looking for this F, which is the resultant force, which is going to cause uh, your bullet to slow down. However, we also do not know at this particular time how much time it's going to take the bullet to pass through the plastic. So we need to know how much time it will take our bullet to pass through the plastic. We can find this time because there are a couple of things we know. For example, we know the velocity of the bullet before it passes through the plastic, which is this 300 meters per second. Then we know the velocity of the bullet after it comes out of the plastic, which is uh, 90 meters per second and we also know the thickness of the plastic which is our ace which is two centimeters and that two centimeters in meters is 0 0.02 so using the info using the v with 90 meters per second the u of 300 meters per second and the s the displacement of 0 0.02 meters we can find the acceleration of the bullet from the acceleration we can find the time so how are we going to do this we use this relationship here v squared is equal to u squared plus 2aa our v is the final velocity of the bullet is 90 meters per second our u the initial velocity is 300 meters per second our s is 0 0.02 meters so in this case uh 90 meters per second squared equals to 300 meters per second squared plus 2a 0 0.02 meters uh, of course when you square things you end up having 8100 meters this these are the units then 90,000 with those units and this thing there. We drop our units to make things a bit more compact. So we end up having 8,100 equals to 90,000 plus 0 .0, 0 0.04a. This 90,000, we take it to the other side. You have got 8,100 minus 90,000 equals to 0.04a. So we end up having 0.04a equals to minus 81,900. You divide both sides by a so we end up having a is equal to minus 81900 divided by 0.04a and this gives you an acceleration value which is equal to minus 2 million 47500 meters per second squared so the first thing you notice about our acceleration is that the acceleration is negative that negative acceleration is telling you that as the bullet is passing through the plastic it is going to slow down the size of the acceleration is in the two millions. It's about two million meters per second squared. This is a very large value of acceleration. So what this large value of acceleration is telling you is that in within a space, within a distance of two centimeters, this bullet slows down very, very fast from 300 meters per second to 90 meters per second. So this is what our acceleration value is trying to tell us here. That A, the negative sign, means that the bullet is going to slow down. And this large value of acceleration means that the bullet is going to slow down very, very fast. Since we have got acceleration, we know there is a relationship A is equal to V minus U divided by T. So if you make the T the subject of the formula here, we end up having T is equal to V minus U divided by A. So we can use this relationship to find how much time it's going to take the bullet to pass through the plastic. The final velocity of the bullet is 90 meters per second. The initial is 300 meters per second. And the acceleration of the bullet you've seen is minus 2,047,500 meters per second squared. So in this case, when you substitute, you end up having T is equal to 90 meters per second. Then there's a final velocity minus the initial velocity, 300 meters per second. Then the acceleration is minus 2,047,500 meters per second squared. When you work out this whole thing here, you end up having a time which is equal to 
0.03 times 10 to the power 4 seconds. So this is how much time it is going to take the bullet to pass through the plastic. As you can see, this is a very, very small amount of time. So what this small amount of time is telling you is that it will not take the bullet the whole day to pass through the plastic. The bullet will pass through the plastic very, very, very quickly. Okay. So now we know how much time it will take the bullet to pass through the plastic. Using this time, we can go back to our relationship. The resultant force multiplied by the time it will take the bullet to pass through the plastic equals to the change in linear momentum, which is the minus 3.14 kgs meters per second. So we substitute the value of time we have found. So we end up having F equals to mod F times this uh, 1.03 times 10 to the power minus 4 seconds equals to minus 3.15 kgs meters per second. You divide both sides by the 1.03 times 10 to the power times 10 to the power minus 4 seconds. You end up having this F is equals to uh, minus 3.15 kgs meters per second then divided by the 1.03 times 10 to the power 4 minus 4 seconds so when you do this you end up having a force f which is equals to minus 3.1 times 10 to the power 4 newtons and this is basically the same as f equals to minus 31 kilo newtons so the first thing you notice is the negative sign so this negative sign is telling you that the force which is causing the bullet to slow down is acting in a direction which is opposite the motion of the bullet so the bullet is going one way this force which is causing the bullet to slow down is acting in the opposite direction and of course the set one is telling you that one kilonewtons is telling you that this is a sizable amount of force which is present so as the bullet is passing through the plastic there is a friction force which opposes the motion of the bullet and as this opposition by the friction force results in the bullet reducing its velocity the bullet loses motion as you can see from the minus from this from the delta p this opposition offered by the force the friction force causes the bullet to lose motion as it's passing through the plastic are we clear? I'm a question, sir. Yes. Uh, is it correct to leave your answer in newtons or you have to change it to... You can leave it in newtons. This is just a prefix, something more convenient. Kilo oh, newtons, yes. Okay. Any other question? For example, in... Ati? What's the other question? For example, in a quiz, if you leave it in newtons, for example, sir, in a quiz, how do you leave your answer in newtons or in pure newtons? I think they should tell you how they want the, 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 the answer. I think they should tell you. Alright. Yeah. Any other question? I've seen a question which says, is linear momentum coming in the test? No, it's not. Okay, let's move on to example number three. Uh, okay, so, so far, what do, the two examples we have looked at have resulted in a loss in motion. Delta P was negative. So let's just look at an example which in which the change in motion uh, is going to be uh, positive. So during a soccer game, a ball of mass 0 0.42 kgs, which is initially at rest, is kicked by one of the players. The ball moves off with a speed of 26 meters per second. Given that the impact lasts 0 0.8 milliseconds, what is the average force exerted on the ball? So you have a ball and your ball has got air in it. It has got a certain amount of mass, slightly less than half a kg. Uh, this ball was at rest, meaning that its initial velocity was 0 meters per second. Here, it says the ball was at rest. So if something is at rest, the velocity of this particular something is 0 meters per second. 
Then after the ball, immediately after the ball is kicked, it moves off with a velocity of 26 meters per second. So the final velocity after the ball is kicked is 26 meters per second. And this kick, which causes the velocity of the ball to change from 0 meters per second, from being at rest, to 26 meters per second, lasts for 8 milliseconds. So the kick lasts for 8 milliseconds. You don't kick the ball the whole day. Like... Your kick is going to learn. It's just for a certain amount, a short amount of time. Within this short amount of time, the velocity of the ball changes from 0 to 26. So you can see the velocity of the ball has changed. The ball has accelerated from 0 to 26 meters per second. And the ball has got mass. This amount of mass. And of course, we know how much time it has taken. So we can use our impulse relationship again in this case. The mass of the ball is 0 0.42 kg, uh, 0 0.425 kg. The initial velocity of the ball is 0 meters per second because the ball is at rest. After the ball is kicked, it goes up, flies off with a velocity of 26 meters per second. And we know how much time the kick lasts. It lasts for 8 milliseconds. So using this information, we can work out the change in linear momentum to see if this ball gains motion or loses motion. So the change in linear momentum delta P is going to be equal to mv, which is the mass times the final velocity. Then this is supposed to be a minus here, minus mu, which is the mass times the initial velocity. So in this case, uh, delta P is going to be equal to the mass of the ball, which is 0 0.425 kgs, multiplied by the final velocity of the ball, which is 26 meters per second, minus uh, the mass of the ball, which is 0 0.4 Two five kgs multiplied by the initial velocity of the ball. Remember the ball is at rest, so the initial velocity was zero meters per second. So when you do this, you work out this thing, you end up having your change in linear momentum being equals to eleven point zero five kgs meters per second. So this change in linear momentum, as you can see here, is positive. This positive value tells you that this ball gained energy sorry not gained energy it gained motion as a result of being kicked and that is what we see when people are kicking footballs when they kick a football that football gains motion so the amount of motion it gained after being kicked was 11.05 kgs meters per second and this is what we call impulse so another expression for impulse we know that it's the the force which causes the ball the object to accelerate in this case the resultant force which caused the ball to increase its speed multiplied by how long the time this is the time how long the kick lasts we know the kick lasts for eight milliseconds so the f multiplied by t is equal to the change in impulse and we know the change in impulse is 11.05 kgs meters per second so here we end up having the resultant force so when you are kicking a ball you're actually applying a force that what the, the the kicking force and how long the force lasts equals to 11.04 kg per second. We know that the kick lasts for 8 milliseconds, which is 8 times 10 to the power minus 3 seconds. So when you do that, we substitute here for the time. You end up having force times 8 point zero time, uh, sorry, 8 times 10 to the power minus 3 seconds equals to 11.05 kg per second. You divide both sides by the time. The kick lasts, so you end up having F, which is a kicking force, equals to 11.05 kg meters per second, divided by 8 times 10 to the power minus 3 seconds. And this whole thing gives you a force which is equal to 1,381 newtons. So, from this, you can approximate that the force is actually going to be equal to 1.4 kilonewtons. So, in this case, the force is positive. A positive force means that this force caused the velocity of the ball to increase. And that is what we see when people are uh, kicking a football. But there are also other times when people when people are playing football and they trap a football. So they slow it down. So when you're slowing down a ball, then you're doing something else. You're making the ball lose motion. So that is done in a different way. According to those people, if you play football, you know how you do that. There's one, well, maybe when you're passing a ball, when you're shooting a ball, there's another bit when you're blocking a ball or when you're trying to 
when you're trying to trap a ball. So basically, the whole exercise of playing football is this whole thing we're talking about here, increasing the motion of the ball in a particular direction. And we know that when people are playing the football, they play it in all sorts of directions. So there is direction, there is how much the ball is going to move in that particular direction and all that stuff. Are we clear? So you can't see the screen. Who else is not seeing the screen? That's here as well. That's the screen. Okay, something should have happened. Let me stop sharing and try to share again. Can you see the screen now? Yes, I can see it now. Oh, okay. Did you, where did you stop seeing the screen? When I was looking at this example? Where? Yes. Just here. Example three. Just here. Okay. So basically here we said you have a ball which was addressed. Then someone kicks the ball. So when they kick the ball, this ball has got mass, uh, 0.425 kgs, and when it's at rest, it has got a velocity of zero. When the person kicks the ball, it ends up having a velocity of 26 meters per second, and the kick lasts for 8 milliseconds. So, when a person kicks the ball, the ball gains motion. When you kick the ball, the ball gains motion. The amount of motion gained by the ball, that is what we're calling the change in linear momentum or the impulse. There are two ways of working out how much motion has been gained by a ball when it's kicked. So in this case, we have this way, uh, delta P is equal to the mass of the ball times the final velocity of the ball uh, minus, this is supposed to be minus, the mass of the ball times the initial velocity of the ball. Since the ball was at rest, the initial velocity is zero meters per second. Then after the ball is kicked, it ends up having a velocity of 26 meters per second. So in this case, uh, delta P, which is the change in linear momentum is equal to the mass, which is 0 .0, uh, 0 0.425 kgs times the final velocity of the ball when it's kicked, which is 26. That's what you have here. So you have got the mass of the ball multiplied by the final velocity of the ball, which is the 26 meters per second, minus the mass of the ball, which is the 0. Uh, 0 0.425 kgs multiplied by the initial velocity of the ball. The ball was at rest when it was kicked, so the velocity was 0 meters per second. So when you work out this change in momentum, you end up having this. Change in momentum is equal to 11.05 kgs meters per second. So you see that in this case, the change in linear momentum, the change, unlike the other two examples we had, in this case, the change is positive. What this means is that this positive change physically means that the ball gains motion. There is an increase in its linear momentum. Okay. So, yes, the ball gains motion. And the reason why the ball gains motion is because it's being acted upon by a force. If, if an object gains motion, it's being acted upon by a force. And that force is what causes the velocity of the ball to increase. So whatever force it is, which the ball gains from you kicking the ball, multiplied by the time, this time is how long the kick lasts, which is we know is 8 milliseconds, is equals to the change in linear momentum. So this bit, the force, the kick force, times the time it takes you to kick the ball, this, when you multiply this, this is equals to your change in linear momentum. So we, that's what you have here. So the FT equals to 11.05 kgs meters per second. So the ball gains motion. We know the time it takes you to kick the ball. So we have been told it's a very short amount of time, 8 milliseconds. And that 8 milliseconds is 8 times 10 to the power minus 3. So when you put 
here you have the force that's what you're looking for multiplied by the time it takes to kick the ball this is equals to 11.05 kg meters per second so you divide both sides by the time so you divide both sides by the time you end up having with having the force equals to 11.05 kg meters per second divided by 8 times 10 to the power minus 3 seconds so this is what you end up having like that so you end up having f is equals to 11.05 kg meters per second like that when you divide there you end up having f is equals to 1. Point, uh you end up having 1380 1381 newtons this 1381 newtons is approximately equals to 1.4 kilonewtons. So this is how much force you kick the ball with for you to give it such an acceleration. Are we clear? Yes. Okay. Uh, last but not least, we want to... This particular object we're looking at when you're looking at motion, your object has got mass. It's also moving with velocity v. So basically, when you're looking at an object, any object which has got mass and moving with the velocity v has got linear momentum. So in that case, the linear momentum p is equals to mv. But you also know that if you have an object has got mass and it is moving with velocity v, you also know that this particular object has got kinetic energy that's what we know an object with mass from the lesson today an object with mass m moving with velocity v has got linear momentum p is equal to mv but we also know from our previous classes that if you have an object with mass m moving with velocity v it has got kinetic energy which is equal to half mv squared so we want a relationship between kinetic energy and linear momentum how are these two physical quantities related to each other so for us to do that what you're going to do is we're going to square both sides so we square p so we end up having p squared when you square p this side then we also have to square this uh, this other side so the mv is squared so we square mv so we end up having p squared is equals to m squared times v squared what we are trying to do is we're trying to change this part this end so that it looks like kinetic energy so the next thing we do is we divide both sides by m so you divide this side by m you divide that side by m so you're doing the same thing on both sides so when you do that this m and one of the m's there will cancel out so you end up having p squared divided by m equals to m v squared this side now this is m v squared it's beginning to look like kinetic energy the only thing missing is the half so what do we do we multiply both sides by half so you multiply this side by half this end you multiply it by half that side you multiply it by half when you do that you end up having half p squared over m is equals to half mv squared now this bit now half mv squared which you have this side this is the expression of kinetic energy we know kinetic energy is equals to half mv squared so this kinetic energy bit this side is equals to p squared divided by 2m so what you end up having is this kinetic energy which is we know is equals to half mv squared is also equals to p squared so whatever the linear momentum is you square the linear momentum then you divide the linear momentum which has been squared by 2m so this is the expression which gives you kinetic energy in terms of linear momentum are we clear are we clear okay uh so we end here uh, the recording is going to be made available to youtube tomorrow we're not having any class so use the time to prepare for your tests on saturday also sleep well on friday do not get drunk otherwise you're going to fail and sleep early because remember you have a test in the morning you also have a test in the afternoon 
So do not stress yourself. Make sure by 21 or 20 hours you are asleep. You need to have a good sleep. Okay. So I'll stop sharing. Okay. And uh, see you next week. And actually see you on Saturday because I have to invigilate the test. So we're going to see each other on Saturday.